I want to start by saying happy birthday. Thank you. I will not sing. Thank you are you. For, you are 42. <laughs> 42. How do you feel? I feel great. I feel like my response to 42 is like, fuck yeah, I'm 42. You know, I think people get so, especially women get so freaked out about aging and getting into their forties and, yeah. and I'm, I'm, I'm having none of that. I think my forties, uh, was my favorite decade. Was it really? Why? Yeah. Uh, you know, twenties is just exploration. Twenties is just, uh, just pushing things as far as you can to see what mm -hmm. will happen. Thirties, you kind of turn the corner. I think uh, this is a generalization, but especially for men, mid thirties, you start asking different questions. Mm -hmm. um, you start, you know, wanting to become self-aware, all that kind of stuff. You, you want to be better. Um, I think. For, I think for women, it comes earlier. And then I think forties, mm -hmm. uh, you get to a place where you're like, okay, now, now I'm actually. Um, there's a lot of acceptance. I like myself. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, there are things I can I could work on, but. Um, I started noticing trees at 40, you know, oh, I started damn, to, yeah. uh, I mean, you know, all the things that you talk about, tiny little, little joys. I, I didn't have any ability or capacity. Like to me, that would have been ridiculous. I, I, I would roll my mm -hmm. eyes at that, you know, in my twenties mm -hmm. and thirties, forties, I got it. And then now being 50, um, I feel the most kind of grounded, uh, I mean, I still have, you know, insecurities and of course I want a lot of yeah, things totally. and stuff, but um i'm 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 not uh, uh rocked off my center as much as I, I i used to be if that makes sense yeah totally you know what i'm noticing about 40s too is like the nature of goals is shifting a little bit so that like mm. i want a goal not because of some insecurity or some sense of deficiency i want the goal just for the sake of it you know what i mean yeah I don't know if that well, makes let sense me ask you this, and I know we, we um, by the way, we have an exciting episode for you today. Um, but how, so, so how has, has your goal changed? Meaning um, from your 30s or 20s into now your, your, your early 40s, is, is it, it's not that you want less. Is it that you want different or what matters to you is different? I think that like the nature of the wanting is different, if that makes sense. Like it's, mm. I, I definitely don't want less. I think I might even want more, but I think in the twenties and thirties, I felt very much like I was climbing a ladder. I was chasing, I was proving yeah. myself. I was yeah. like, you know, doing these things. And now I'm like, no, I have things to do. I have stuff mm -hmm. to say. I have things I want to accomplish, not because that is going to show me that I'm legit, but because it's just a thing I want in itself, you know? Do you believe in yourself more these days? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's kind of hard not to because you, yeah. even if you are resistant to that, you, there's this much longer history of surviving, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it's like I have, I, I know a lot more clearly what I'm capable of because I keep doing it. Yeah, yeah, the scoreboard says so. Yeah. And I think now I'm in this space and this is funny too, because I feel like this is maybe a reverse of what you just said, where I'm like, oh, how far can I push this? Like my goal when oh. I turned 40 was to get as strong <laughs> right. as I, as I could. And now I'm like, okay, so I got, I definitely am stronger than I ever was in my life. Now I want to go, I want to see where's the limit, you know? Well, okay. So yes. Um, I think in your twenties, you're doing it um, out of either rebellion. So the why is mm. different. Um, pushing yeah, right. because um, maybe because you don't like yourself or maybe because you want to mm -hmm. prove someone wrong. It's very kind of, uh, oh, what's the word? It's um, reckless. Yeah. So in your 40s, you're pushing past limits and, and living on the edge and being curious. And it's not coming from mm -hmm. a reckless place. It's coming from, um, I believe I, I can. It, it's coming from a sense of worth place. I think that's yes. the difference. Yep, exactly. I think that's perfectly said. That's exactly what it feels like. Yeah. So today we're going to talk about uh, trauma bonds. I mean, speaking of 20s, 30s, um, a lot of the trauma bonds happen. Um, I don't know if this is true. I, was, I don't know why I'm saying this. Maybe, maybe it's for me. Uh, a lot of trauma bond bonding happened for me early on. So young love, um, mm. just because we're not aware and we can mistake those mm. as um, as falling in love or the one, you know, because there's a lot of uh, chemicals that are shooting in your brain. Yeah. Dr. MC McDonald, a good friend of mine, and now officially a regular on my podcast because you've been on my podcast multiple times. Woo. And um, I love that we just text each other and you're on, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
we don't have to go through uh, our people and scheduling all the stuff right. that that you know um <laughs> some guests require so uh we're going to talk about trauma bonds she wrote an article on psychology today it's up there if you want to check it out about uh trauma bonds we also ran a retreat on this topic and we also have a video course that you're gonna um have access to on either of our platforms coming out soon so uh this is a big topic and um i don't know about you but i get tons of questions about trauma bonds i do yeah and i see a lot of um kind of misinformation too floating out there which worries me because i think this is something we really need to get right yeah because that's the thing that makes it possible for us to get out of these situations when we find mm-hmm. ourselves in them and not feel shame for repeating them, which we often do. And so, so yeah, I get a lot of questions about it for sure. I have your article in front of me, um, but I want to start okay. with this. And I think your article does the same definition. What is a trauma bond? So this is a great question, and I think this is where a lot of the misinformation comes from. We've now used this term to define a lot of things, but it comes from somewhere really specific. And so the the official definition Mm -hmm. is whenever you have a relationship that has intermittent harassment, abuse, or intimidation that's mixed in with really intense bonding and love, what that then creates is this sort of like alchemy where you get this incredibly strong bond that actually changes Mm -hmm. can change the personality of both people in the dynamic and make it very very difficult to get out is that bond stronger depending on um if it's familiar or smells familiar to your childhood I think it's stickier, yes. And yeah. I think like when you said a second ago that a lot of your trauma bonding happened in your 20s and, and mm-hmm. like earlier in life, I think it's one of the reasons for that is because we don't yet know how to recognize the red flags that actually signal relationship mm-hmm. abuse. You know, when we think of abuse, nobody likes talking about that word because it sounds like we're talking about the most extreme examples. But Right, like like no, one, no one's hitting each other, so it's not abuse. Right, right exactly. Right. But you know, relationship abuse, as you know, can consist in like emotional manipulation, mm-hmm. gaslighting, um, silent treatment, gaslighting, yeah. and financial and in your abuse. 20s, yes. Oh my gosh. Right. Yeah. That's actually really shockingly common um, yeah. or shocking to me. I didn't realize how common it was. Um, and it can be shaming. It can be vague threats. Like mm-hmm. it can be, um, it can be a lot more covert than we realize. And so when you're in your twenties, especially if it's like your first love, you're not going to necessarily know how to identify or contextualize any of those experiences. And so then you get stuck and then you repeat and then you repeat and then you repeat. And if the source is coming from stuff in your childhood, I think the fact that it feels like home becomes like a really strong magnetic pull for you to yeah. stay. Yeah. In, in a weird way, it feels safe, even though it's not safe, because yeah. that's kind of what you're used to. Yep. And it feels safe in your system. Like your whole like body feels safe because it mm-hmm. feels like fami- it feels so familiar. This is a good transition. And um, one of the what I thought was one of the, one of the interesting um, parts about her article is uh, why we repeat them. So it's not just being aware. Um, mm-hmm. It's actually breaking the pattern. Uh, most of us, if we're not aware, we are we are repeating them. So uh, in your article, mm-hmm. you talk about uh, and I think you give three points, but uh, why we repeat. Yeah, and this this is the whole thing um, when you're at brunch with your friends and after a breakup, and you're like, "Yeah, I keep dating the same person. It's only the faces mm-hmm. change." Uh, there's this repetitive behavior going on, or being attracted to the same type of person. Yeah, pattern recognition is such a powerful like, mm-hmm. such a powerful tool for self reflection, but I think it often gets clouded. Whenever we have a pattern, we have tons of information, but that information doesn't get released to us if we are steeping ourselves in shame. Mm -hmm. And so when we find out we're repeating the same relationship over and over, our first move is to go to like, oh, why can't I get my shit together? We shame ourselves for it Mm -hmm. instead of investigating, okay, what, why is this happening? Like, why am I attracted to this kind of person? And what, what reveals itself when I'm able to look at this without shame? And so there's four theories about why we repeat these sticky, awful relationships, even if we cognitively know that we want a healthier relationship. The first one is really simple. We repeat because we want to master. 
So there's mm-hmm. something that happened to us early in life or a previous relationship and relationship could be anything in the course of your lifetime. So that could be with your right. best friend growing up. It could be a relation, your first love. It could be a family member. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's something that you haven't mastered that happened before. And so your brain is kind of bringing you to the situation again. So you have the opportunity to master what you didn't before. When you and say when you say master, um, are you mm-hmm. saying to correct, to give yourself a corrective? What do you mean by master? To integrate, to understand mm-hmm. so that mm-hmm. you can figure out how to put that kind of relationship away in the larger story arc of your mm-hmm. life. So like, I think if we work with an example, maybe it's easier. So if you had a parent who, who was um, emotionally abusive, if they neglected you emotionally, you might, that's, that's not something that you have the capacity to integrate between the ages of zero and 18, just in terms of like brain development or tools. And so you find yourself attracted to people who neglect you over and over and over again. And part of what your system is doing is putting you back in that same situation so that you can integrate what happened originally. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Uh, There's a, uh, um, as you talk about it, uh, just with trauma in general, there's almost like a um, a filing or a refiling that mm-hmm. you're doing, you know, kind of naturally or trying to do. Yeah, totally. All of our experiences just want to be like organized and understood. And and when we when something isn't integrated, we have a our brain has a huge problem with that. The, so um, this, um, why we pre one is mastering. Two? Yep. The other one is going to sound counterintuitive is to actually avoid mastery. So sometimes I think mm-hmm. we repeat because. Again, if going back to the example of if you had emotional neglect in your childhood and you haven't processed that yet, then that means that you haven't really looked at what it means for you to have parents who neglected you. That's a heavy thing to understand mm-hmm. and contextualize. So sometimes it's easier to repeat the situation and then it's just the way the world is. And you don't really have to come to any like come to Jesus about your parents. So sometimes mm-hmm. I think we repeat to avoid mastery. That's really interesting. Right. So like a part, so a part of us is um, trying to master and then a part of us, can they both happen at the same time simultaneously? Oh, I think so. Totally. Yeah, because we, yeah. you know, our behavior, like, I think we're so funny because we think, especially this day and age when we have so much access to psychology and, and different mm-hmm. ideas, I think we think we know ourselves much more than we're actually capable of knowing ourselves because part of what it means to be human is to be hidden from ourselves mm. you know and well, so also the, oh, the com- complexity of us as well totally because you know? i think we're always yeah. trying to simplify yes yeah totally and pin it to one thing and say well this yeah. is because i'm an infj or this is because i'm an enneagram five right, or right. whatever and it's right. like or well, yeah i'm an aries <laughs> right there's probably like 40 different layers to that yes. that contribute and yeah so i think so, sometimes so we both re- pistons are pumping uh they're both they mm-hmm. could be both happening at the same time um what else there was there was more there's two more. So, okay. so one is the, so another one is that we repeat because it feels like home, which we've talked about this a little mm-hmm. bit. Like essentially mm-hmm. in this case, you're in your twenties, you don't even recognize that your relationship contains emotional neglect because you haven't even realized that your childhood contained emotional right. neglect. It just right. looks the same. Yeah. It feels I mean, the what, same. What you, and, re- what you realize is uh, um, how you feel. I mean, in right. your twenties, you just go by how you feel and everything's kind of life or death yep. and extreme. Yeah. So the feelings yep. are extreme. Totally. And by the way, like you can have this come out in like a work relationship. It doesn't necessarily have right. to be a romantic right. relationship. I noticed this in a big way in 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 bosses that mm. there was this sort of pattern of like a very specific type of volatile boss. And I was like, why am I so comfortable with these people? Like yeah. off the bat, they feel like home. And then I was like, oh, because they feel like home. Like that's what my mom was like. So yeah, and I wonder if if there's a part of that where uh, whether it is um, you know your professor, your boss, or that kind of mm-hmm. a, a authority where you're um, part of you also trying to uh, seek uh, seek their approval, validation. Totally, you know, yeah. because that's what you're used to doing, and maybe. Um, parents didn't give you that or you're always uh you know trying to totally. get validation yeah so trying to get yeah there's a. yeah exactly whatever's unintegrated comes out in that behavior mm. and so it's like if we don't bring it into the light we don't know there's a carl young quote about this that i can't remember off the top of my head but it's very simple i think it's on my website just about like what we don't bring into the light motivates our behavior and we don't mm-hmm. then know what's motivating our behavior And the last one, which I think is the most hopeful, is that we repeat and we then get stuck repeating because of our neurobiology. 
Yeah. So there's a thing in the brain called the Mohawk of self-awareness, which is essentially just a bunch of brain structures that kind of wire together to make you into a self. Mm -hmm. So someone who knows what they want can orient yourself in space and time, make decisions, and then execute on those decisions. And when you're in um, a trauma bond, research has shown that those parts of the brain stop lighting up mm. because you're so overtaken with the other person making sure that they're okay, orienting yourself in that relationship and dealing with the chaos that you you actually lose yourself. Yeah, so it's like, almost like you don't have the ability to see red flags. Totally. You know? Totally. And so, wow. and then, and even if you could see them or even if like a friend pointed it out, like I think one of the places we fail the most in society is in the way that we fail to support people who are in abusive relationships or trauma bonds. Yeah. Um, because we're like, don't you see the red flag? Yeah. And the person's like, no, I see it. But then they don't do anything. And then we get frustrated yes, with frustrated, them. Right, right. And um, this is why DV, uh, domestic yeah. uh, violence and those kind of relationships are complicated. And it's not as simple yep. as um, you're not being treated well, just get out. What are you doing? Yeah. And it's totally. almost like uh, you almost don't have the ability ability to see and if you do um you can minimize and then there's all this other mm -hmm. stuff you know afraid to leave and, and all that oh yeah financial stuff kids like whatever else yeah. is enmeshed totally yeah, super complicated yeah it takes someone in an abusive relationship an average of nine attempts it's either seven or nine i can't remember wow. to actually get away from good leave. Yeah. Wow. So let me ask you this. Uh, mm -hmm. If you if you've had uh, uh, or you you realize that you um, are attracted to trauma bonds, you've had that in your life. That's been a pattern mm -hmm. for you. Um, now what? What do you do once you're aware? I mean, is it so, as easy as yeah. picking a different relationship? Well, no, I think so. I think the first thing to do is to try to get yourself out of the one that you're in. And I think even that sometimes is too big of a step. I think the the hopeful thing about knowing some of the neurobiology behind a trauma bond is that once we know what's like at play in the brain, then we know what to do to counter it. And so right. I would suggest that the very, very first step is that you try to reconnect that Mohawk of self-awareness. And the ways that you do that are to reconnect with yourself. Um, mm. And you can do this in tiny little ways, like make start making playlists from every decade of your life to reconnect with the music that motivated you when you were 20 or 10 or whatever. Mm. Um, you know, get back into old hobbies that you used to do. And you can be doing this as you're contemplating leaving. And then um, what that will accomplish is that you'll start to reconnect to the brain parts that have gotten disconnected, which will help mm. it make the choice eventually to get out. And then I think this is a place where we really need to rely on other people for support and um, have a trusted group of friends or family or even one or two people that can mirror reality back to you when you're getting lost. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I think we talked about this a lot at the retreat, actually, like getting into a different kind of relationship is a whole other piece of yeah. this because yeah. When there's all this neuroscience and chemistry going on in these trauma bonds, a healthy relationship can feel really weird, boring, yeah, boring. or dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Well, dangerous also because healthy may mean yeah. that you may have to show sides of yourself that you never exactly. have or be vulnerable right. or, yeah, make eye contact. Right. Make be there. Love. Show up. <laughs> yeah, totally. Right. Be, and, and like allow yourself to be seen. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So, and so let me ask it. you this, when you, when yeah. you, um, I believe that, uh, there's nothing more convincing than a new experience. So not just, uh, mm -hmm. um, something in your mind, but, um, convincing your body that you are safe or lovable or whatever it is, right. Whatever yep. limited belief that you have. Um, if you then choose someone, um, uh, who is healthy, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and there, I feel like there's a tipping point where you got to swim past all the discomfort mm -hmm. and, you know, the, the labels you're going to put on this, or maybe you're going to want to run that, that knee jerk. But when yep. you get to, Oh, okay. Now I could be in this. I'm actually now starting to like this. Mm -hmm. um, what happens? Are you now rewiring or reconditioning your, your brain? Um, yeah. You're, you're probably, definition? yeah, I think you're doing all three things. Like you're, you're reintegrating the memory that didn't get integrated the first mm -hmm. time or the experience that didn't get integrated. So you're healing your past 
you're giving yourself opposite action, or as you say, opposite experience, Mm -hmm. which trauma needs opposite action. We can't just do this cognitively. And then on a kind of um, nervous system level, allowing yourself to move through the discomfort of being in a healthy Mm -hmm. relationship is its own healing because you're, you're, it's like you're, if you imagine your body as like a, a small, scared toddler, it's like you're leading that toddler to safety. And all the while mm. you're saying to it, like, I know this is scary, but I promise you this is the way, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, uh, I, I also want to point out that uh, or remind people that it doesn't mean um, to make a choice. Like you don't have to just eat broccoli. You're not just right. going to be with someone just because you know that person's safe, but there's no attraction. I mean, you still have to, you know, you, we all have types and we're attracted to and we can't just throw that out the window. Right. Because then that's, that's not like going to last. That's not going to have, have right. legs either. Right. Totally. And I think um, w- w- there's so much noise out there about this. Again, like we talked mm. about this a lot. Like. I think you can think of it as like a different kind of fuel source. Like when you're in a, in a really volatile relationship, when you're in a trauma bond, there's a lot of chemistry, but it's very like flash in the pan. You know, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when you're in a healthy relationship, there should also be chemistry. Like, I don't think we're trying to advocate for boring relationships. Um, But the, the, the fuel source is more sustainable. So instead of a flash in the pan, you have like a kind of growing connection and the chemistry is always there. And maybe it's at the same level. It doesn't have those huge ups and downs, but that Mm -hmm. eventually when you kind of get used to being in the same spot instead of the ups and downs, you realize that that sustainable fuel source chemistry feels so much better, you know? Mm. Yeah. It's not just sugar. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You know, what's interesting. I had this, um, revelation lately um i remember early on when i was a screenwriter and um uh, i got my first uh um agent and she mm-hmm. was at kind of a boutique agency and uh she really believed in me and i remember i left her for um a bigger agency mm-hmm. and uh, one of the one of the 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 top 3 biggest and i remember her saying to me John, you you always go for like the name brand or the cooler mm-hmm. thing or the designer. And I remember um, she said this kind of hurt, and I remember it really stuck with me. And when I uh, and at the time I probably was defensive, but it's true. And I think where that comes from is um, I know this is kind of off topic, but you know I throw boomerangs and the, the, hopefully they come back uh, <laughs> in the eighties. <laughs> it's never mm-hmm. as long as it's under the umbrella of life. Um, right. In the eighties, <laughs> because my parents were always gone. And and this was in in a way traumatic. Um, mm. I was always um, as a Korean American here. Uh, I mean, starting with the bull haircut and not fitting in. Growing up in the eighties, mm. where uh, we were the only Asian American family. I mean, for blocks, so everyone was was basically Caucasian. Um, yeah. Feeling like an outsider, I always I was positioned to um, try to fit in, and so mm. I got to fit in if I wore designer jeans. Or if I had cool mm-hmm. shoes, or if it, or if I had some kind of ability, like if I could spin on my head, or you yeah. know, pop a wheelie around the block. Um, so I think that trained me, or it kind of laid these tracks for when I'm older. Always trying to, um, whether it is <laughs> get the biggest agent, or or uh, or chase the the prettiest girl in the room, or wear designer jeans, whatever it is, just mm-hmm. trying to fit in, trying to be a part of the quad, if you will. Yeah. Um, because. Yeah because me lacking, you know, a sense of self. And, 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 um, I say that because I think, um, going back to trauma bonds, I I think, uh, um, one of my patterns, uh, because my, in a way that childhood was traumatic, even though it wasn't traumatic in, in what, what usually people think as far as like, you know, abuse or sexual abuse, but it was traumatic because I, I, I was very alone. And mm-hmm. uh, I, I've always felt incomplete, so I had to fit in. So there was this uh, urgency, there was this uh, fight or flight, there was panic, there was desperation. Um, and so uh, I, I, I think in relationships, a lot of, um, as I got older, um, trying to get approval by chasing mm-hmm. um, the, the prettiest girl in the room or trying to, quote unquote, get someone mm-hmm. so that could be my ticket into the quad. And that's so like, I'm so glad you shared that story, actually, because I think it's so important. And it reflects back on why it's so critical that we define trauma correctly. Because if we have Mm -hmm. the wrong definition floating around there, and we say, 
okay, the only traumas that are real are sexual assault and physical abuse and War. combat. Yeah. Right. Then you miss that that was a formative experience for you. You miss that you felt um, isolated in that way mm -hmm. that was dangerous, mm -hmm. that was interpreted by your system as danger. And so then you carry that wound into all of your relationships and all of your behavior comes out of that. And that can go successfully or it can pull you apart or both, right? It can go yeah. successfully for a little while and then it can start to pull you apart because you never feel comfortable or safe in one place with one person and one mm -hmm. agency or one mm -hmm. job. You know what I mean? Um, you, know, you know, what's ironic is the, <laughs> the, the agency that I, I left her for. Um, yeah. they were too big for me at the time. Um, right. I'm with them now. <laughs> oh, author. funny. Yeah. It's full the same circle. Agency. Yeah. Full circle. Um, That's wild. I've also been in LA for so long. Yeah. Um, this is really interesting. Uh, and, 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 you know, um, one of the things that, that, uh, that we talk, and maybe you can repeat it here, um, is, yeah. uh, just you know now we're talking about trauma in general um your definition of trauma which i think is is actually beautiful oh thank you yeah and yeah. by the way there's a whole chapter on trauma bonds in my book unbroken the trauma mm -hmm. response is never wrong so if you if you're interested in this and you want to do more of a deep dive there's a case study that i think is really reflective of what these things feel like from the inside um but trauma in in my definition is anytime you have an unbearable emotional experience that mm -hmm. lacks a relational home yeah and what is unbearable to you at any point in your life depends on where you are. And so right. when you're 10 or 12 or 15, you might look back now from 50 and say like, oh, what a silly thing to want designer jeans. But mm -hmm. at 12, yeah. that when, was When people make fun of you if right. you didn't have them. Yeah. Right. That yeah. was overwhelming in a way you had no relational home for. And so then that, that totally sets itself up for, for trauma later in life. You know, um, what's kind of sad is I think uh, our high school is, or that whole experience uh, for most people is unbearable, um, unless yeah. you were lucky to be, um, you know, one yeah. of the cool kids or super attractive or whatever. Um, for most people, high school was traumatic. That was an yep. unbearable, <laughs> unbearable uh, yeah. space that, 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 yeah. Or middle school maybe, and then high school yeah. is okay. But then yeah. like you, and the, and the thing of that is that we then carry that into our adulthoods and we don't understand ourselves. Yeah. So our behavior starts to come out and we, we sabotage ourselves and our success. And it's because of this stuff that we didn't even label as traumatic. We don't validate, you know? Yeah. And uh, this is also why um, I love what you're doing. I love that you are taking um such a cemented definition of trauma and um adding water making it wet cement you know um <laughs> yeah and, and kind of redefining it uh you could pick up her book it's wide on amazon or anywhere uh it's called unbroken and yeah. um it's your first well it's not your first book because you've written um academic books yeah it's the it's third but it's the first, first in the yeah that's yours the, yeah and it's also like in the trade space. Academic books are so expensive. I love the other two, but they're, yeah. you know, $85 or whatever. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Unbroken is a lot less. Yes. It's like 19 or 17 yeah, or something. Yeah. yeah. And there's so like pick, a Kindle version and an audio book, which are even cheaper. So yeah. So pick up that book. Uh, you could also follow her. Um, she's trying to be active on social media as much as she can, you know, juggling everything yeah. that, that, that she does. But uh, um, is your TikTok yeah. and Instagram the same handle? Yep, it's just mcph mc dot phd. Sorry, yeah. on both Instagram and P and uh, TikTok. Is that also your new license plate? MC dot phd. <laughs> <laughs> no, I should check to see if I can get that one. That's funny. I have. Um, I think. I think. I think. You know what? It, it's. It's. It's all. It has to match. So you got to get the license yep. plate to go through TikTok and your, and your mm -hmm. Instagram. Um, I, I want to talk about this just a little bit if you have time. Yeah, of course. Uh, I was thinking about, um, and I know we talk about Barbara. Barbara Fredrickson, um, the whole positive psychology once in a while, yep. and um, the power of positive emotions. So uh, you yeah. talk a lot about tiny little joys, which obviously I think produces positive emotions. Mm -hmm. What happens um, in the brain when we give ourselves positive emotions? Because um, I'm also working on a, on a book about breakups, and I think mm -hmm. one of the prescriptions is, at least for me, um, I had to, and I kind of stumbled upon it. I had to 
uh, when I didn't have anything in life, I had to find a way to give myself positive emotions. So mm -hmm. I wasn't just in dread and worry. It's kind of the yeah. vine that pulled me out of the quicksand. And yeah. it kind of lines up with, I mean, because when you talk about tiny little joys, you're not talking about win the lottery or 911 Porsche turbos. Uh, those mm -hmm. can be joys as well. You're talking about, sure. you know, the morning uh, pour over coffee or the hummingbird mm -hmm. in the window, and, and, and which really yeah. makes uh, life go go from you know pleasantville to like from black and white to color yep totally and, and um, i oh yeah. go ahead yeah no i'll just i can relate because that was 10 years of my rebirth mm -hmm. um when i was broke and i just you know i i star coffee came in star foam and <laughs> i mm -hmm. um listened to wayne dyer and i just walked around the streets and my little motorcycle and it's like it's all i had but yeah um, i didn't know this but i think i was changing my brain yeah, totally, totally. Because so we are in some sense like hardwired to imprint negative experiences because mm -hmm. that keeps us alive. Survival, so if I yeah. remember, yeah, what made me sick, then I won't eat it again right. and then I'm more likely to survive. So, and that's that's adaptive and important and we need that. The problem is that we have to manually imprint positive experiences. The yes. really cool thing about that though is that the research has shown that when you do experience tiny little joys and imprint them, meaning like kind of sit with them for a moment, savor them, really mm -hmm. like experience them and notice that you're experiencing them. You turn on something in the brain called the hope circuit, mm -hmm. which because of the way that the brain circuitry works, it takes up a lot of energy. And so that turns down the fear circuit. And so the negativity loop that we sometimes get stuck in that's full of like your brain just trying to be like, hey, don't forget this bad thing. Don't forget that bad thing. Right. Here's what keeps us safe. Don't forget all these negative experiences. That loop gets shut off. And you are experiencing this very tiny, very accessible, very little thing. And just maybe for two minutes, you're turning off the fear circuit and turning on the hope circuit. The more you do that, the quieter the negativity feedback loop gets and the easier it becomes to access the hope circuit, which is also the part of the brain that helps us plan for the future, hope, mm -hmm. imagine. Mm -hmm. So these things like sound very small, but they're critically important prescriptions against depression, against mm. um, you know, real grief and sadness and trauma. They are, they are really powerful things. They also overlap uh, gratitude and mindfulness. Yeah. Yep. You know, um, Completely. anything that expands you. One one of the things, because I, I'm the, I'm the guy that has to simplify things to understand yep. that brings the street level. And sometimes I just break it down to, is it expanding me or constricting me? Yeah. Right? Are my shoulders hunched uh, because yeah. of fear, panic? Am I running, hiding, numbing? Or yeah. is it expansive? Is it, you know, so fear is hunched. Love is yeah. expansive. So oh, whether that's such a great cue, both like cognitively and physically, because you could check in with yourself a hundred times a day and be like, yeah. where am I at? Am I doing this? Yeah. Or am I like, yeah. yeah and, and also who's in front of you and, right. and what is your, what are shoulders doing? Um, right. So, yeah, I, I think um, positive experiences. Um, I'm trying to tie it back to trauma bonding, but it also doesn't need to be tied back. But um, giving yourself well, positive, positive experiences, yeah. it's, it's a huge piece of just life rewiring. And it can, totally. And it can be tied back to trauma bonds because I think what happens is when we're in a bad situation, we get this this incorrect idea that we need something equally huge in goodness to counter mm -hmm. the situation that we're in that's bad. And what we know to be true on the brain level is that that's false. Yeah, these tiny little things and noticing them like you did in your experience where you were like, okay, the coffee in the styrofoam cups, the streets of LA, my motorcycle, like, the more you meditate on those things, the more you connect back to yourself, mm -hmm. which then makes it possible for you to get out of sticky situations to recognize where they came from to do the integrating work to make sure you don't repeat them again. So I think it is, it does relate back. Absolutely. When you say connecting, connecting back to self, um, mm -hmm which is also something that, that I say as well. Um, and we're kind of saying the same thing, but also I love that we have um, mm -hmm. different angles on this. Uh, what happens in the brain when you do connect back to self? I always tell people that uh, the, just the way that life is, as we mm -hmm. grow up and pay taxes and you know get married, have kids, we disconnect to the part of us that, that, that was true, that was our solid self. Mm -hmm. um, and connecting to the spirit of that person 
um, sometimes yeah. is what growth is about. So this idea of a reunion, you know, and so mm-hmm. um, what happens in your brain, you know, when I, what happens in my brain when I do butterfly pull-ups to connect to the 12 year old who was spinning on his head? That, yeah, I love that, that image. Cause I was thinking, I was trying to think of one frantically. So the reason that I love, so Bessel van der Kolk called this, this set of, um, brain structures, the mohawk of self-awareness. Mm-hmm. And the reason that I love that it's a mohawk is that it is this like rebellious, I think somewhere in our teenage years, we meet ourselves for the first time and we start rebelling mm. and we dye our hair purple and maybe yeah. we get a mohawk yeah. or yeah. we're spinning on our head and we're like, yes, I am a thing out in the world mm-hmm. and I am taking action, you know? <laughs> and so whenever you, whenever you connect with tiny little joys, you're lighting up your mohawk of self-awareness. So you can visualize that as like, a bright pink or purple mohawk on the top of your head Mm -hmm. that every time you connect with a tiny little joy, that part of you lights up and you become the most rebellious, badass, centered version of yourself. You find your cape. Yes, totally. You know um, why I can relate to everything you're saying is uh, I didn't know this at the time, but this is what happened when I decided to not work in treatment centers and tuck my shirt. I tried, I tried it just, it, it I was, cons- my shoulders were unhurched over and, um, you know, tucking yeah. my shirt in and wearing wrinkle, wrinkle free pants. It just wasn't me. Yeah. And so when I stopped that and I connected to, um, you know, more of an honest part of me and I was like, meet me at the coffee shop and then, you know, just teased your jeans and doing a couple of sessions at the park and all of that. My, mm-hmm. my Mohawk, my purple Mohawk went up. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Totally. <laughs> and, um, it's just like, yeah. That's, but you know what? I think that's where our potential lives. I think that's where yes. we are uniquely ourselves. I think that's mm-hmm. where um, we can make a dent. Yep. Yeah. Totally. I, I feel the same way about the academic world. Like, I, man, I fit myself into that role super yeah. well. Yeah. But, but there's no mohawk there. So. No, but you have one now. Yeah. <laughs> it's multicolored. It's, it's got multicolored. Sparkles. Yes, yeah. peacocking. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, what should we end with? Do you want to end with uh, a life revelation? Do you want to end with um, some questions to give the listener? What do you want to end with? Or maybe a dad oh, joke? <laughs> Let's end. With, I, I like. I love a dad joke. Um, I, don't, I don't have any dad jokes. You don't have any dad jokes. No. I. Um, what's a life revelation you've had recently? Oh, I, ha- I have so many all the time um, throughout the week. One life revelation. Or the most recent, you know, um, I mean, you know, this I've been. um, Oh, uh, yeah, I I got one. So um, I've been struggling uh, in the last, I guess, year with um, career writing, all this kind of stuff. Uh, I've been very fortunate to um, publish books where they kind of um, naturally were seamless and I didn't have a lot of problems Uh, in my most recent one. uh, I've had a lot of problems that were out of my control, so which is good for me, right? Uh, mm-hmm. And so I got to experience something new and challenging. And um, the the more I um, felt out of control, I said to myself, "Okay, I've been here before, even though it's different, and the solution is always going to be the same." John, you got to write yourself out of this. Mm-hmm. You got to write. You're not. You're not going to be able to call people. You're not going to be able to you know, um, tap dance, you're not, mm-hmm. go to the coffee shop and do what you've been doing for the last 30 years, write mm-hmm. yourself out of this. And I started saying that to myself and that's what I did. I, I went away for four days and I fucking wrote like I used to write back in a day, 10 hours a yeah. day. And, um, I knocked out half a book. I mean, a lot of cut and paste. So I'm not like, it sure. wasn't a page one, but, um, yeah. but, um, the first half of the book, so 150 pages in four days of rearranging, mm-hmm. and I was determined to write myself out of it, um, turned that in, got a great response, and now I'm back on track. And, and now the, 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 the problems um, – I mean, I don't want to say problems, but yeah, now I've gotten, I've gotten past the, uh, uh, some of the uh, hurdles now, and uh, we'll see what happens. But it wasn't like um, any kind of uh, – it, you know what it felt? It felt honest. It felt honest. Mm-hmm. Like I had to earn it, you know? Yeah. You know what I thought when you texted me that you were like, because I knew what was going on. And then you were like, hey, I sent them back the book and this is the feedback that I got or whatever. Yeah, yeah. My first thought, and you hadn't even said that yet. 
like I didn't know any of this piece. My first thought was like, oh, he's back. Oh, interesting. Yeah. 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 And I, and it wasn't like a false he's back because no. it wasn't like an announcement. It was like, put your head down and go work. Yeah, exactly. Like, pr pr prove to yourself um, by putting words on the page. And, and in a way, Not returning to yourself. Yes. Right? By like, returning to yourself. Like, you know how to do this. Go do it. You know? Yes. And it was just yes. like, yeah. So you're that the only was... person in the world that could do that so fast. I mean, I, I mean, I don't know about that, but but what, 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 yeah. whatever it is you do in this case for me, it was that. But um, that was my my most recent life revelation. A pretty big one is when there's a lot of noise or turbulence. Kind of go back to the basics. Go do what yeah. you know how to do. Yeah, you know. So that's one of my, my favorite you know. writing prompts it comes from Buddy, your friend, who I want yes. to be my friend, Buddy Wakefield, who, Buddy uh, which Wakefield. is write yourself out of the war. Oh yeah, he does say that. Yes. Which I love that. Yeah, that's that's exactly what I did. I wrote myself out of the war, the battle. Maybe it wasn't a war, but yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. What is your most most recent revelation? You know, it's funny. I had a um, I I, don't, I haven't checked with him, but I think he'll be okay with me sharing this. I have a I have a friend who is going through a health journey, and he had an emergency mm. brain surgery last week. Um, actually on my birthday, which I was really grateful for, because I was like, well, if I have any leverage in you know the universe maybe my birthday is the day i have leverage um mm. and he ended up being fine um we don't know what's going to happen next but um we had this super deep conversation when he, when he got home on friday and i it was just this incredible reset of like the the shit that you think matters probably doesn't matter and yeah. there's no need to feel shame about that cuz the whole world is structured to make you think that all that shit is important but like, if you can find a moment to have a meaningful conversation with someone you might not get to talk to again, it's such a gift because it's just this huge perspective shift, mm -hmm. you know, of mm -hmm. like, maybe it's these conversations. That's the whole fucking point of our life. Oh, like I this conversation that. right now, maybe yeah, it's about yeah. the hang, you know, not about yeah. some big achievement or some big meaning, sure. but just about like being together, you know? I love that. The power in the moment. Right. Little things are big. Little things are big. Yes. Big conversations or little conversations are big, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for uh, this conversation. We're going to have many more. Thank you. This was um, great. Yeah. You, you know, you know, what's interesting is, uh, and also maybe this is a therapist in me. Um, it's not just about what's on the surface. When, when we talk about relationships, whether we're talking about friendships or intimate relationships, um, there's so much more happening that we don't see. And oh, yeah. I think one of the things that you do for me, um, just because we have so much history, is um, it doesn't matter what we talk about. I feel grounded when oh, we have an yay. exchange. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, and it doesn't totally have to do. be, it's not even about the yep. reminder. Um, it's just mm -hmm. about us being in the same room and, and having some words or a coffee. Um, and it doesn't, we could be in the mountains, we could be on Zoom, we can be, uh, yep. it doesn't matter. Um, and I think part of that is because, I mean, we've known each, I mean, you know, my entire story and I know yours. So like we've known yep. each other for so long, you know, so there's <laughs> yep. a, there's a, yeah. there's a safe tree part of it that, um, oh yeah, you know, totally. Which is friendship, right? I love the safe tree thing. I feel the same way. I also feel like my thing when, whenever I talk to you is that you cut through all the noise mm. and it's whatever we talk about feels like it's like right at the center of the thing, you know? Mm. Which I don't know if that makes sense outside of my own head, but that yeah, is a very does. grounding feeling of like, okay, we're going to talk about the thing. Like, finally, all this yeah. fuckery. Now we're going to talk about yeah. the thing. Yeah. I love it. Well, thank you for uh, talking about the thing today was trauma bonds. And uh, yeah. I hope you got a lot out of it. Go follow Dr. MC and uh, be well. Thank you. Bye.